Hello, everybody. I um, hope you're having a good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce Erin Stewart. She's a post baccalaureate intern in the Plant Ecology Program at Archbold Biological Station. Um, Erin came from the University of Puget Sound, where she got her undergraduate degree, and she's been an intern here for a little over six months. Um, and she's done a great job, obviously a, a tough time to uh, be in a new place uh, during COVID, um, but she's been very organized and enthusiastic. And um, she, after she uh, finishes her internship this week, she'll be heading up to Georgia. She'll be working for the University of uh, Georgia and she'll be working in North Georgia studying ruffed grouse. Um, but today she's gonna talk about uh, phenology and the shrub Garbaria heterophylla and uh, implications of for, uh, for this plant. Erin? Hi, thank you for that introduction, Eric. Um, as Eric said, my name is Erin Stewart and I'm an intern in the plant ecology program at Archbold Biological Station. Today, I'm going to be presenting my research on the implications of flowering phenology in Garbaria heterophylla. There were a few things I noticed right off the bat when I moved to Florida. One of these things was the topography coming from Washington State. It is very flat here. Another thing I noticed were the spiders. They're a lot larger and more colorful than the ones I was used to back west. A third thing I noticed was flowering phenology. Phenology is defined as the study of the timing of life history events. And in my case, I was noticing that a lot of plants were flowering at strange times, seemingly out of sync with when we would expect that species to flower. Just a few examples of this. This is a picture of Garbaria, which you'll hear a lot more about in the coming slides. I took this photo three weeks ago and Garbaria typically flowers October through December. So this individual was blooming slightly late. This is a picture of Palafoxia that I also took three weeks ago. Palafoxia generally blooms from September through October. So this individual was a bit more out of sync with its typical flowering window. This is a picture of tar flower that I took in the middle of January and tar flower usually blooms May through June. So this individual was so out of sync with the rest of the population that it's hard to say whether it was blooming early or late. Noticing these things got me thinking about flowering synchrony and asynchrony. And we can think about asynchrony at multiple levels. At a broad scope, we can think about community asynchrony, and that's where you have different species blooming at different times of the year. For example, some species may be blooming in the spring, where others are blooming in the summer. You can also think of asynchrony at the level of a population, and this is where within one species, we're seeing individual plants flowering at different times. At an even finer scale, we can look at individual level asynchrony. And this is where we have one plant with multiple flowers, and these flowers may be opening and senescing at different times. For my project, I looked at both population and individual asynchrony, but for this talk, I'm just going to focus on individual asynchrony. So what are the implications of flowering synchronously or asynchronously at the individual level? One implication concerns pollination. It's fairly well established that pollinators are more attracted to larger and more visible floral displays. And so a plant that is blooming more synchronously has a larger, more visible display and therefore is more attractive to pollinators. In addition, once pollinators have reached this plant, they're able to pollinate more efficiently because they have less distance to move between individual flowers. On the other end of, a spec on the, other end of the spectrum, flowers that are blooming more asynchronously might be less attractive to pollinators and pollinators will be able to pollinate them less efficiently. This would seem to select for a high degree of flowering synchrony, but this isn't always the case because there are other factors that can counteract the pressures of pollination. One of these things is seed predation. Just as pollinators might be attracted to larger and more synchronous flowering displays, 
seed predators might also be attracted to these traits. Therefore, a plant that is flowering very synchronously might experience higher rates of pollination, but also might experience higher rates of seed predation, whereas a plant that is flowering asynchronously might have lower rates of pollination, but also lower rates of seed predation. And you can see from this how different levels of pollination and seed predation might select for a variety of levels of flowering synchrony. To recap that, in general, we see that higher synchrony is associated with increases in seed set as well as increases in seed predation. A number of studies have also documented that earlier flowering start date is associated with an elevated seed set as well as higher levels of seed predation, although the opposite has also been documented in some studies. There is less literature on how the duration of flowering impacts these two variables, but logically it makes sense that a flower that is open for longer would be more likely to be pollinated but also would be more vulnerable to predation. This was the general framework I was working with, and I was interested for my study in seeing how habitat fragmentation might alter these dynamics. Studies of habitat fragmentation often concern edge effects. Edge effects are differences in abiotic and biotic conditions at the boundary of two habitat types. These habitats can be two natural environments, but they can also be the boundary between a human modified landscape and a more intact natural landscape. And in these cases, the different areas are referred to with special terminology. That boundary between a human modified landscape, such as a road or a housing development, is referred to as the edge. And that interior area that is more intact is referred to as the matrix. This diagram is just showing a few of the abiotic differences we might expect to see at the edge versus the matrix. We might expect that there is higher wind levels, greater drought stress, a greater vulnerability to disturbance, and higher light and nutrient levels. However, in the ecosystem I was working in, there's actually been research that shows that soil moisture is higher in sandy gaps compared to vegetated matrix areas. And this is presumably due to the fact that there's more competition for water by roots of plants in these matrix areas. Therefore, I expected that edges might actually have higher moisture levels than the matrix in the ecosystem I was working in. For my study, I wanted to see whether seed set and seed predation varied between edge and matrix habitats. At the edge, I thought that my focal plant species might experience less competition with other plant species for resources like light, water, and nutrients. As a result, I would find my focal plant at a higher density and it might also produce a greater number of flowers. This would essentially result in a larger floral display, which would be more attractive to both pollinators and seed predators. I therefore thought that along the edge, I might observe plants that had higher rates of pollination and seed predation. Meanwhile, in the matrix, I thought that my focal species would be subject to more competition with other plant species, and therefore it would occur more sparsely and produce a fewer number of flowers. This would result in lower pollinator and seed predator attraction, and therefore these plants would have lower rates of pollination and lower rates of seed predation. I incorporated this thought process into that original framework I presented to develop these hypotheses. You can see at the top, I am hypothesizing that seed set and seed predation will be higher in the edge compared to the matrix. In addition, I thought that a higher synchrony would still be associated with an increase in seed set in both habitats but the magnitude of this increase would be greater in the matrix because the matrix plants would be more pollinator limited. Similarly, I expected that a higher synchrony would result in a higher rate of seed predation in both habitats, but this increase would be greater in the matrix, again, because of the greater limitation in seed predation to start off with. I expected to see similar trends for the other phenological variables, 
with earlier start date and longer flowering duration associated with increases in seed set and seed predation, but with these increases being especially pronounced in the matrix. So how did I go about testing these hypotheses? I selected Garberia heteropola as my focal species. Garberia is a shrub in the aster family and it's found only in Florida. It's considered threatened and it flowers near the end of the year. It is genetically self-compatible, but it does rely on insects or pollen transfer. These insects include a diverse array of bees, beetles, and butterflies. Garberia experiences moderate levels of seed predation and it also produces wind dispersed seeds, which is important because it means that the flower, its flowering and fruiting phenology isn't dependent on activity periods of seed dispersers. I conducted my study at Archbold Biological Station. For those of you who are familiar with the station, I was working in the five burn units just south of Main Drive, which you can see at the top of the map. Um, these burn units were characterized by scrubby flatwoods vegetation and had last been burned in 2015 and 2016. I mapped all of the Garberia plants in this area and then I randomly selected 28 plants to serve as my focal individuals. 14 of these plants were along the edge of fire lanes and those were considered my edge population. And the other 14 were in the interior of the burn units and I considered these to be my matrix population. After I had selected these focal plants, I then selected focal blooms. I defined a bloom as a distinct cluster of flowers or a flowering head. And you can see an example of this circled on the right. For each plant, I tagged 15 randomly selected blooms. I then conducted phenological observations on these blooms. I did these observations every other day starting on October 26th, which was the day that my first bloom started flowering. On each of these days, I would mark whether a bloom was budding, flowering, or senescent, or dead. This is just a time series of one of my focal blooms. You can see that on November 1st, it starts in bud, and then it begins to flower remains in flower for several days and then senesces. It remains pretty much unchanged for the next few days. And then you can see that the bristles start to open as the seeds prepare to wind disperse. After I had collected these phenological observations, I was able to calculate values for the three phenological variables I was interested in. Start was the day on which a bloom started flowering duration was the number of days that a bloom flowered for, and synchrony was a more complex calculation, but the important thing to keep in mind was that a synchrony score of zero represents a bloom that flowered completely asynchronously with the other focal blooms on the plant. So these were blooms that had a flowering window that did not overlap with any of those other focal blooms on the same plant. Meanwhile, a synchrony score of one was a bloom that flowered completely synchronously with the other focal blooms on the plant. The equation for synchrony looks like this. This is representing the synchrony of bloom I. And essentially what it means is the cumulative number of days bloom I overlapped with the other blooms on the plant in terms of their flowering windows divided by the total number or the number of other blooms on the plant, which would be 14 multiplied by the flowering duration of bloom I. With these values for my phenological variables, I then had to determine the seed set and seed predation rates of each of my blooms. And to do this, I collected the senest blooms and sorted through the cypsilla. Cypsilla are the single seeded dry fruits produced by Garberia and they can contain a seed or be empty depending on whether the attached flower was pollinated or not. I sorted these cypsilla into three categories. The first was insect damaged cypsilla. These either had small holes in them or they had entire insect larvae inside. The second category was empty cypsilla. These had no signs of insect damage, but when I pressed down on them, they flattened, meaning that they had not 
developed a seed and therefore the associated flower had not been pollinated. The third category was full sipsilla. These had no signs of insect damage as well, but when I pressed down on them, they maintained their shape, meaning that they had developed a seed and the attached flower had been pollinated. Overall, I sorted through more than 36,000 sipsilla, and from this, I was able to calculate proportions for seed set and insect damage for each of my blooms and insect damage was my proxy for seed predation. With all of this data, I was then able to start my statistical analysis. I used linear mixed effects modeling with AIC to figure out what model best described my data. The explanatory variables I was interested in were again, flowering synchrony, flowering start, and flowering duration, as well as the categorical variable of location being edge or matrix. My response variables were seed set and insect damage, and I included focal plant as a random effect. What this allowed me to do was control for variation in seed set and insect damage that was due to which plant a bloom was on, and really focus on variation that was due to my four explanatory variables. With that, I'm going to get into my results. I started off with the initial hypotheses that plant density and flower abundance would be higher at the edge compared to the matrix. In the figure on the left, you can see my results for plant density. The y-axis is showing the number of neighboring garbaria plants within five meters of each of my focal plants. And you can see that there is a tendency for edge plants to have a greater number of nearby neighbors than matrix plants. The figure on the right is showing the total number of flowers produced by each of my focal plants. And again, we can see that there is, are significantly more flowers produced by those edge plants compared to the matrix plants. These results support my initial hypotheses that plant and flower density would be higher along the edge compared to the matrix, which is good because I based subsequent hypotheses on this premise. I also took a quick look at whether flowering phenology varied between the edge and the matrix. I found that flowering synchrony was slightly higher in the matrix, whereas flowering start was slightly delayed among edge blooms. Flowering duration didn't show much variation between the two locations. Now I'm going to get into my main results, starting off with seed set. My full model is shown here. And essentially it asks whether seed set is predicted by flowering synchrony, start, duration, bloom location, and the interaction of location with those three phenological variables. I ran this full model as well as pared down combinations of these variables in subsequent models, and then selected the best model based on AIC values and model simplicity or parsimony. You can see my top three models here based on their AIC scores. And the best scored model is also the simplest. So it's the one I chose for interpretation. This model says that seed set is predicted based on flowering synchrony, start and bloom location. So how do these variables affect seed set? Starting with location, we can see that seed set was higher in edge blooms compared to matrix blooms. And this is what I had initially expected. The box on the bottom is showing the magnitude of this difference. And essentially what it means is that if we had a bloom at the edge that had 100 flowers, we might expect 40 of these flowers to produce a seed. Meanwhile, if we had a similar bloom in the matrix that also had 100 flowers, we might expect only 29 of these to produce a seed. Here are my results for flowering synchrony, and we can see that there's a positive association between synchrony and seed set. This means that blooms that were flowering more synchronously with the other blooms on the plant produced a greater proportion of seeds than those that were flowering asynchronously. This again is what I had expected to see in my initial hypotheses. Last, I found that there was a negative relationship between set such that blooms that flowered earlier produced a higher seed set than blooms 
flowering later. This was also what I had expected in my initial hypotheses. Now I'm going to move on to my results for insect damage. I used the same full model for insect damage, except seed set is replaced as the response variable by insect damage. These are my top three models. And again, the one that scored the best was also the simplest. So it's the one that I selected for our interpretation. This model says that insect damage is predicted by flowering start, as well as the interaction of duration and location. In terms of flowering start, we see a very similar trend as the one we saw between flowering start and seed set. In this case, blooms that flowered earlier experienced higher rates of insect damage than blooms that flowered later, again in line with the initial hypotheses. In terms of duration and location, we can see that flowering duration is on the x-axis and then the two slopes represent matrix blooms and edge blooms. For matrix blooms, there was a positive relationship such that increases in flowering duration resulted in increases in insect damage. However, in edge blooms, there was not a significant relationship between flowering duration and insect damage. With that, I'm going to move into my conclusions, starting off with a summary of my results. First, we saw that seed set was higher among edge blooms compared to matrix blooms. And this is in a line with what I had initially hypothesized. However, I found that seed predation was actually higher among matrix blooms, counter to my expectations. In terms of synchrony, I saw that a higher synchrony was associated with a higher seed set, although there was no variation between edge and matrix plants. And I did not see an effect of synchrony on seed predation. Earlier start date increased both seed set and seed predation, but again, there wasn't an effect of location on this increase. Finally, longer flowering duration didn't seem to have any impact on seed set and duration didn't impact seed predation among edge blooms. However, a longer flowering duration was associated with a higher rate of seed predation among matrix blooms. And this is similar to what I had hypothesized although I did expect to see a small positive relationship among edge blooms as well. So what are the implications of these results? The first one is that phenology impacts fitness. And here I'm defining fitness as the combination of seed set and seed predation because these both contribute to the overall number of seeds produced by a plant. In particular, we saw that increases in synchrony increased seed set and therefore raised fitness. Meanwhile, earlier bloom start date increased fitness in that it increased seed set, but it also potentially had detrimental effects by increasing seed predation. We also saw that edge effects impacted fitness. In particular, blooms that were along the edge of the fire lanes experienced a higher seed set and therefore higher rates of pollination whereas blooms that were in the matrix experienced high rates of seed predation. And this suggests that edge plants are potentially more fit due to their location. Finally, we saw that there was an interaction between phenology and edge effects. In particular, we saw that the effect of flowering duration on seed predation depended on where a bloom was. For blooms that were in the matrix, a longer flowering duration negatively impacted overall fitness Whereas for blooms that were along the edge, there was no impact of flowering duration on fitness. Overall, these results imply that edge effects may alter the selective pressures on phenology. And over time, this may lead to divergence in phenological traits between different populations of plants. Another important consideration is interactions with climate change. There have been a lot of studies looking at how climate change is impacting plant phenology and in particular studies have found that there is an association between climate change and advances in flowering start date as well as increases in flowering synchrony. A lot of plant populations will likely be subject to both climate change and habitat fragmentation and as a result there will be a lot of complex interactions between climate change, habitat fragmentation, 
phenology, and plant fitness. Finally, a potential next step for this project would be to perform reciprocal transplants. This would allow for the separation of genetic and microhabitat effects. And essentially we could really focus on how microhabitat is contributing to this variation in phenology and fitness that we are observing. With that, I would like to acknowledge everyone that helped me over the course of this project. Specifically, I would like to thank Eric Mengus, Stephanie Kuntz, Scott Ward, Lexi Siegel, Haley Dole, Alexis Jackson, and Vivian Slater. I would also like to thank everyone at Archbold Biological Station for making my time here so educational and interesting. Now, I would be happy to take any questions you have. Very nice talk, Aaron. Um, the people that should uh, that are viewing, uh, feel free to put your questions in the Q and A. Um, and I'll start off with a question of mine, Aaron. Um, you also uh, you also said you looked at um, asynchrony uh, um, among plants uh, in the population. Did you get consistent results uh, as you did with the asynchrony within plants? Um, I did for certain factors. So in plants, an earlier bloom start was also associated with higher seed set and higher insect damage. Um, but in turn, and also for location, um, the results were similar. For, um, for seed predation for insect damage, I actually saw that a longer flowering duration and um, higher levels of synchrony decreased seed predation, which was somewhat counter to what I expected. So um, yeah, I had to kind of think through why that might be different at the plant versus the bloom level. Okay, I, uh, we have uh, several questions here. First, uh, is there a common name for these flowers? Um, the, the plant, Garbaria heterophylla, it's just referred to as Garbaria. That's its common name. And then um, it is an aster. And the like for what the flower structure is called, these are called ray flowers. So hopefully that answers your question. OK, and Hilary Swain uh, wants to know um, what Mark Dayrup uh, found as pollinators in the database. And, is, and she's wondering if uh, these, pollen, these diversity of pollinators is something that's likely affecting the phenology of the plant. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the citation I gave for that, um, there were about 13 different bee species listed. Um, and I think one thing that's important about the fact that it does have a diverse, a diversity of pollinators is that um, it's not, it's probably not facing the pressure of pollinator limitation. Some plants have only one pollinator, and that means that if the whole population is blooming all at once, it might be hard for an individual to be pollinated because these pollinators may not be able to get to everything in that shortened bloom window. So when there's just a single pollinator species, it actually might be more beneficial for a plant to flower asynchronously to spread out its flowering so that hopefully there's less competition for pollinators between different plants. But because Garbaria has all of these different pollinators, that's unlikely to be a factor. So um, the, the stronger pressure is pollinator attraction rather than pollinator limitation. Okay, I have a couple of statistical questions here for you. Um, an anonymous attendee uh, says, I'm gonna read the whole thing here, it's a few sentences. In your figure with synchrony and its impacts on seed set, it looked as if there were very few blooms with low synchrony values. Did you look to see if these were possible outliers and if removed might change your observed pattern? Yeah, yeah. So I actually did notice that as well. And um, I have an extra slide on here just in case that question was asked. Um, but I think this is the figure that is being referred to. And you can see that I just have five data points that are below about 0.25 in terms of their synchrony. 
and um, it does look like these might be dragging down that trend line. Um, so I did go ahead and remove those and run another analysis. And I did find that the trend line was slightly less steep. Um, and you can see kind of the unit change in seed set per unit synchrony in those boxes at the bottom. But overall, um, even with these lower values removed, there was still a significant relationship between synchrony and seed set, and that relationship was still positive. So um, yeah, overall removal of those outliers didn't impact my results very much. I think that your large sample size really helped you find um, some subtle patterns. And Reed Bowman has a, a question about that. Uh, he knows that there's a lot of scatter in your graphs and wanted to know what the R squared values were in the models. Uh, and whether it's possible that the best fit models still don't explain much variation. Yeah, so um, from what I remember, one of my models does, um, I think my models for seed predation generally have a higher R squared. Those did get up to about 70%, um, but for seed set, they were a lot lower around 25%. So there definitely is a lot of variation that is still not explained by these models. Okay, we have a few more interesting questions here. Um, Betsy Bowden um, uh, asked, what do you think cues the plant to flower synchronously? Is it related to competition? That's a great question. And um, there's, there's actually a lot that's still not understood about what causes plants to flower when they do. Um, one of the, some of the um, common explanations are environmental cues like day length and temperature, precipitation, winter chilling, that sort of thing. But if that was, if those were the only things affecting flowering time, we would expect that plants all subjected to these same environmental conditions that are in the same place locally would be flowering entirely synchronously, but this isn't the case. So there are other factors that do contribute to phenology. One of these is just the amount of resources that an individual plant has saved up, and that can determine about when it's flowering. Another thing is um, there is some degree of genetic control over when a plant flowers that's heritable. Um, and then there also are some biotic effects that are less understood. Um, but for, for example, um, plants that flower every other year, they're able to synchronize up their flowering and flower on the same offset year based on um, how much they get pollinated on one year. And that can determine whether they flower the next and that sort of thing. So there are yeah, there are genetic factors, physiological factors, environmental factors that all contribute to the observed synchrony or asynchrony. And uh, Scott Ward wants to know if higher rates of synchrony <clears throat> are less common or important in show your species versus wind pollinated species. Yeah, um, so I think that's definitely the case. Um, for wind pollinated species, the primary concern would probably be just blooming at um, the time that allows you to cross pollinate with another member of the same species. Um, so it wouldn't, they wouldn't face any pressures due to pollinator limitations. So it would probably be most beneficial for all of those wind pollinated species to be flowering synchronously. And for showier species, um, they will likely have less trouble attracting pollinators, although um, a lot of pollinators will show seasonal variation in their activity levels. So those plants will still need to align their flowering with peak levels of pollinator activity. But um, the other consideration again is cross-pollination. So even if these plants don't need to flower synchronously to enhance pollinator attraction. They do need to flower synchronously to ensure that they have um, a recipient for their pollen and they're able to obtain pollen from another plant, particularly if they're a self-incompatible species. I'm gonna combine two questions from Dan Kesey and they're about fire. <clears throat> 
Um, he wants to know if Garberia heterophylla is a fire maintained species. And if so, were plants in the matrix therefore at a competitive disadvantage? That's a good question. And I don't know that there is a lot of research into the fire ecology of Garberia um, based on the fact that it was pretty much like it was of a similar size um, vegetatively in both the edge and the matrix. I think that it probably does show a pretty robust response to fire, but I, I don't really know much about its fire response. And Dylan Winkler would like to know what are some of the common seed predators? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, you can, the picture of the, the main one I found is in the top corner of this slide. And um, that's pretty much the only thing I found in my Cypsilla. And I wasn't, I didn't actually identify this, but um, it did seem to be just a single species of seed predator, which was pretty interesting. But um, yeah, it is important to note that these, what I observed were only larval seed predators. I didn't see adult seed predators. Okay, I have a final question for you uh, from Steve T. Um, pointing out first the total seed production, it will result from both seed set and seed predation. You wanna know which habitat resulted in higher production of non-predated seeds. Yeah, so the edge plants, they had um, higher levels of seed set and higher or lower levels of seed predation. So those edge plants were able to overall set a higher proportion of their seeds. And um, kind of going back to those initial graphs too, we saw that those edge plants were producing more flowers overall. So that is adding to the effect that edge plants are producing numerically a lot more seeds than matrix plants. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Aaron, and thank you everybody for those great